Hi, and welcome to Debunk File. My name is Sepp, and today we're going to be talking about the most famous unidentified serial killer in American history. The one, the only, the Zodiac Killer. That's right, for our second video of this year's Debunktober, we're going to be discussing this demented figure. As you all know, we've said this plenty of times before, but we tend to not cover unsolved murder cases because we feel like we can't really add anything to them. But of course, every rule has its exceptions. Possibly our most outstanding video of the year so far was on the Black Dahlia, but ironically, today's case takes place in the same state, California. From December 1968 to October of 1969, the Zodiac Killer took the lives of five confirmed victims, but claimed to have taken the lives of as many as 37. Similar to the case of the Black Dahlia, there is a lot of misinformation, although this time the leading cause isn't yellow journalism, as you will soon see. While this case doesn't contain that much information in terms of what the killer did, there is a metric ton of misinformation regarding the suspects, so once again, we are here to attempt to tell it right. Now, it should go without saying, but again, this is literally the most famous unsolved murder spree in the history of the United States, besides probably Jack the Ripper. It's likely the most famous unsolved string of murders in the world. Something about a man that completely outsmarted and tormented everyone looking for him is just terrifying, yet fascinating at the same time. As a result, he has been represented in pop culture a plethora of times. Just about every fictional serial killer depicted as a tortured genius or sending letters to the public is drawing from Zodiac. This has actually led to most people believing serial killers are always smart, when that is certainly not true most of the time. You name the media, and the Zodiac has been there. Music, literature, video games, television, a bizarre internet meme involving a politician, you've got it. There have been, of course, quite a few movies based either directly or indirectly off of him, with the most notable being David Fincher's 2007 film, Zodiac. That movie is one of the rare cases of an absolutely fantastic film based on an unsolved series of murders, unlike some of the others, including Jack the Ripper and, of course, the Black Dahlia film. On the subject of fame, something almost as famous as the killer himself is the relentless pursuit that many people have engulfed themselves in when attempting to catch him. And as we all know, nobody ever did. The psychological effects of trying to catch this killer are so infamous. It was actually the main plot point of the aforementioned Zodiac movie. As the film's tagline said, there is more than one way to lose your life to a serial killer. People have literally ruined friendships, careers, marriages, and even their own lives trying to solve this case. And tonight, we might do the same. In order to figure this all out once and for all, we need to go through the detailed timeline of the Zodiac's reign. We're going to talk about everything this man did, from start to finish. After that, we will of course, give our input on who the killer might have been all along. The last request I have is to simply sit back, relax, and turn those lights off. Let's do this. On December 20th of 1968, the very first confirmed murder attributed to the Zodiac Killer occurred. The victims on this tragic night were 17-year-old David Faraday and 16-year-old Betty Lou Jensen. They just began dating two weeks prior and this was officially their first date. Faraday promised Jensen's parents that they would be back by 11pm. Unfortunately, as we know now, they would never return home. Around the time Faraday had promised to return, someone stopped their car and got out. This man ordered Faraday and Jensen to get out of the vehicle. As Faraday was leaving the car, he was suddenly shot in his head. Jensen tried to flee, but was shot in the back five times. The crime took place at Lake Herman Road in Benicia, California. As we know, the killer was never caught. At the time, obviously with this being the first victims, the Zodiac Killer wasn't known yet, and so the police assumed that this was just a senseless act of violence. They of course searched for this killer for a while, but by the end of the summer, they all but halted. There were no witnesses to the crime, and the killer left no evidence outside the 22 caliber bullet cartridges. The most famous thing about the Zodiac Killer was the relentless letters that he would send to the police in various newspapers. But this didn't begin just yet. So at the time, this case, while quite tragic, like any other murder, wasn't viewed as anything extraordinary. Yet. 
It took until July 4th of 1969 for the next killing to happen, and this is when his infamy truly began. At Blue Rock Springs Park in Velaho, which was a mere 10 minutes away from the previous site, 22-year-old Darlene Farron and her friend 19-year-old Michael Magot were enjoying the 4th of July celebration. Suddenly, a car pulled up next to them just before midnight and just as quickly drove away, only for it to return a few minutes later. The driver got out and walked towards Farron's car, holding a flashlight in his hand. Mago briefly saw the man for a second before being blinded by the light. At that exact moment, the man began shooting the two with a 9mm pistol. Farron was hit three times and Mago was struck two times. As the man started to walk away, Mago began screaming in pain, resulting in the killer coming back and shooting him two more times. When help arrived, little could be done for Darlene Farron, as she was dead on arrival. However, by good fortune, Michael Mago managed to survive despite gunshot wounds to his face, neck, and chests. And then, the most infamous aspect of the case began. Roughly 45 minutes after the shooting, Velaho Police Department dispatcher Nancy Slover received a call from a payphone. It was a man with a very low, monotone voice. He gave Slover the following message. Want to report a murder? If you will go one mile east on Columbus Parkway, you will find kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. A few weeks later, on August 1st, the letters began coming in. Three letters were sent to the Valaho Times Herald, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the San Francisco Examiner, each repeating the same message. Dear Editor, I am the killer of the two teenagers last Christmas at Lake Herman and the girl last 4th of July. To prove this, I shall state some facts which only I and the police know. And, well, he did. On this message, though, there was one other thing he said. If you do not print this cipher by the afternoon of Friday, August 1st, 1969, I will go on a kill rampage Friday night. I will cruise around all weekend, killing lone people in the night, then move on to kill again, until I end up with a dozen people over the weekend. With these letters, he included ciphers that looked like this and this would become a common theme. He'd send in ordinary letters and attached to them were ciphers that he claimed would reveal his identity. On August 7th, another letter was sent, and this time the killer gave himself a name. The letter began with the now infamous phrase, Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. The next day, Donald and Beatty Harden of Salinas, California managed to crack the 408 symbol puzzle. The message read as followed, I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with the girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise, and the ones I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name, because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for the afterlifes. The numerous spelling mistakes appear intentional. The message, deranged. The last part of the message, has never been deciphered. These letters promising more crimes and answers, along with tormenting police, was only the beginning. Fast forwarding to September 27th, the Zodiac Killer would, unfortunately, strike again. This time he did it at Lake Berryessa, about an hour away from the previous two murders. And again, we had a victim somehow survive. On this day, friends Brian Hartmill and Cecilia Shepard were both spending time at this lake, and while lying down they noticed a strange man approaching. The man was dressed in a bizarre costume that resembled an executioner's hood with the Zodiac's trademark symbol stitched onto the front. He was wearing a pair of clip-on sunglasses to hide his eyes. He was carrying a knife and a pistol. He claimed that he had recently escaped prison and was robbing them of valuables. After talking for upwards of 15 minutes, the man bound both Hartnell and Shepard with a clothesline. Just as the situation appeared to be ending, the man took out his knife and started brutally stabbing both Hartnell and Shepard. Hartnell was stabbed six times in the back. Shepard was stabbed ten times in the front and back. After the killer had left, a fisherman had spotted Shepard and Hartnell and got help. Both victims were rushed to the hospital, where Shepard fell into a coma that she'd never awake from, and Hartnell miraculously survived the stabbing. 
Like last time, the police once again received a call from the man himself an hour after the attack. He called the Napa County Police Department, with Officer David Slate picking up the call. Like before, he spoke in a monotone voice. I want to report a murder. No, a double murder. They are two miles north of Park Headquarters. They were in a white Volkswagen Karma G. When asked who he was, the man then began walking away, but not before saying, I'm the one who did it. Unlike previous attacks, the Lake Berryessa attack left behind a lot of evidence, in addition to a witness surviving. Some women noticed a strange man in the area right before the attack. In addition, tire and shoe prints were recovered. Hartnell's testimony is quite important as he was with the Zodiac for roughly 15 minutes. Unlike Michael Magot, Hartnell got quite a good look at him, resulting in several police sketches. Both of him in costume and from reports of a strange man around the lake before the attack began as pictured here. One thing I find interesting is that the drawing here doesn't at all resemble the ultra famous sketch we always see that was drawn following the fourth attack. One last piece of evidence was found on Hartnell's car. The Zodiac drew his symbol onto the car door along with the dates of the past two murders. This next attack happened less than a month later on October 11th in San Francisco around 9.55pm. For this one, the Zodiac posed as some random guy on the street that needed a taxi ride. Naturally, at the end of his taxi ride, he shot the driver, 29-year-old Paul Lee Stein in the head. The weapon was again a 9mm pistol, although it wasn't the one used to kill Darlene Farron. After the murder, three kids in a house near the murder watched a man get out of the cab, wipe down some of the blood, and walk away. They quickly reported this crime to the police. However, due to a deeply unfortunate mix-up, the police set out looking for a person of color. Officers Donald Fuke and Eric Zelms remember driving to the crime scene and passing a white man with light hair and glasses. When the dispatcher fixed the error, the officers realized that was probably the killer, but they couldn't find him. Despite this incredibly bad luck, some good evidence was still found at the crime scene. Among the evidence included bloody fingerprints that likely belonged to the killer. In addition, the kids were able to provide a clear description of the killer, resulting in a police sketch and that is the one we all know. At first, San Francisco police assumed it was a robbery gone wrong until more letters were sent in. The letters that the police and the press got were unbelievably horrible. The first one starts off with the usual, where he claims that he was the murderer of the taxi driver, and proves it, this time with fragments of Paul Stein's shirt. However, he then mentions that he could have been easily caught as stated earlier, but wasn't. The ending though is where we see how truly demented this man was as this is one of the most disturbing messages you will ever see, especially if you are a parent. School children make nice targets. I think I shall wipe out a bus some morning, just shoot out the front tire and pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out. The Zodiac Killer was now basically a terrorist. Police had to send escorts to school buses, parents across the state were horrified, and this event would leave a lasting mark on many children, including a young David Fincher. The murder of Paul Stein would mark the last confirmed killing that the Zodiac had attributed to his name, but it does not end there at all. In fact, from this point forward, his letters only became more and more common. On November 8th, the San Francisco Chronicle received a new Zodiac sign to decode as well as another letter, where he requests the code he made to be put on the front of newspapers because he's been getting lonely, and if he gets lonely, he may do his thing. The following day, he wrote some more. This time, he mentions his growing anger regarding the police, who, according to him, made up lies about him, such as leaving fingerprints, when he claimed to have never done so. In fact, he explained in great detail how he tricks the police in his crime scenes. Because of this anger though, he will no longer let the police know when he murders someone. One other thing he said was that he really didn't look like the sketches that had depicted him in everyday life. Whether he's telling the truth or not is unknown, but it's definitely something worth noting for the future. The overall letter is more unhinged than usual. He brings up the aforementioned school bus plan and reveals that he has made a bomb and wrote down all the material he used to make said bomb. A month after that, he returned once more, this time asking for help claiming that he can't remain in control for much longer and might take his ninth and tenth victim soon. This time, that's all he said, and naturally the massive panic continued. 
By this time, he was known far and wide across the United States, and the outrage to catch him was at an unbelievable level, especially if you lived in California. For a few months, the Zodiac was silent, but of course, he was still talked about by millions each and every day. He would return eventually, though. On April 20th of 1970, the Zodiac Killer would return once more, this time writing a note with a code that supposedly revealed his real name. And two months after that, he made another code that allegedly told where his bomb was, among many other things. He claimed that he shot another man, and also claimed to be upset that civilians weren't wearing the Zodiac buttons on their clothes. He ended the note by saying that the police had until next fall to dig up his bomb. At this point, the messages start getting a little bit repetitive, as pretty much all of them include him either getting mad at the people of San Francisco and threatening them with various things, or him doing the same but with cops. However, one of them was pretty terrifying, as it mentioned him owning and threatening to torture slaves, which is something we obviously can't prove or disprove, but is most definitely something I did not know about coming into this mystery. But here is where things get really strange. After 1971, there was actually a gargantuan three-year gap until the next letter, which came in January of 1974. Nobody has ever figured out what caused this gap. We don't know if he left the country, was thrown in prison, or perhaps just intentionally stopped. In the three-year time frame, some citizens tried to solve the case on their own. The most notable attempt at the time was by a pizzeria owner, who made a B-movie called The Zodiac Killer, entirely as a ploy to catch the real killer. It unfortunately didn't work. When he finally returned, the Zodiac mailed quite a few letters in a short time frame. But then on July 8th, he would send one more message, and never return. Again, there's another bizarre part to this final letter, and by extension, the last four in general. They didn't include threats at all, and were all talking about random subjects such as praising the film The Exorcist as a wonderful satirical comedy, complaining about how violent the film Badlands was, and mentioning columnist Marco Spinelli, who was the subject of his very last letter. He didn't even refer to himself as the Zodiac either, leading some people to be suspicious as to if these were authentic letters. Throughout his letter campaign, he kept marking them with a kill count by Zodiac, followed by the phrase, SFPD equals zero. This exorcist letter came with the message, me equals 37, SFPD equals zero. Some more letters were reported after 1974, but it seems pretty likely they were fake. Overall, I find these final letters incredibly interesting. However, from this point on, we are left in the dark regarding the whereabouts of this killer. Perhaps he died, or perhaps he felt content with his work and just stopped. And that about wraps up the timeline of the Zodiac. Of course, with this case, there are hundreds of theories and myths, and if we went over each and every single one of them, we would probably be here until the next millennium. But whenever one arises due to a suspect, we will go over it. Speaking of suspects, I think it's about that time. Unlike our last true crime case, we aren't going to have 10 suspects, as we instead narrowed it down to just six. Compared to last time, there obviously isn't as many subjects. However, unlike our previous endeavor, where almost every single suspect has no convincing leads, this time, all of them have much more to them. So this is about to get interesting. Let's just get right into it. The first suspect is without question the single most famous of the entire case, and that is Arthur Lay Allen. He is at the center of the influential book Zodiac by Robert Gray Smith. The David Fincher Zodiac film, which is based on the book, features Allen quite heavily. Allen served in the US Navy until he was dishonorably discharged. He later became a teacher until he was fired for sexual misconduct with students. The story of how Allen became a suspect in the first place is also thoroughly intriguing. You see, back in the late 1960s, a man named Don Chaney was living in college with Allen's brother Ron, which naturally led to Chaney becoming friends with Allen. However, in 1967, Chaney supposedly claimed to Ron that Allen had attempted to molest his daughter. After this point, he claimed to have never seen Alan again. In 1971, Cheney wound up telling this story to a friend of his, and he included details that seemed to insinuate that Alan was the Zodiac Killer. 
In Cheney's story, he mentioned that Alan confessed his desire to kill couples at Lover's Lanes using a gun with a flashlight attached to the barrel, which is somewhat similar to what the Zodiac did to Darlene Farron and Michael McGough. After telling the story, his friend reported Alan to the police, and the police subsequently interviewed Don Cheney for about an hour. In September of 1971, using the information given to them in the interview, the police officially listed Allen as a suspect. They took action in multiple ways, including interviews and other stuff we will get into a bit later. However, one important thing to note was that they searched Allen's trailer and found nothing implicating him in the crimes, so they really didn't take him seriously anymore after that. However, it doesn't end there. We're only getting started. You see, Alan owned a watch that featured both the name Zodiac and the Cross Circle logo. For many people, when hearing this, you might think that this is it. It's him. However, it's important to note that the word Zodiac and the symbol he used didn't just come from the Zodiac Killer. Now that might sound obvious, but yeah, the Zodiac logo has been around for a long time. The Zodiac watch company did indeed make watches with the cross circle logo, but they didn't invent the emblem. It comes from astrology. Also, it's worth noting that the watch was quite popular at the time. Details regarding when exactly Alan got this watch have also become shrouded in misinformation as the years have gone by. But the point is, having a Zodiac watch alone isn't exactly enough to prove that he was the man behind it all. It's minor circumstantial evidence at best. Once again though, there is still more to Alan's case as this is only the start. Don Cheney also mentioned that Alan told him that he always wanted to taunt the police with letters, and at the time he supposedly told him this information. The Zodiac Killer hadn't started his reign yet. This is also used as a massive piece of evidence that Alan must have been the killer. But the thing is, we're going off of word of mouth, and it is impossible to prove that Alan actually said any of this stuff. Cheney's reliability gets called into question down the road, so keep it in mind. Now of course, while the before mentioned search of his trailer was the final thing the police did to him, it was not the first. The police questioned him multiple times, and they received admittedly interesting results. On the day of the Zodiac stabbing at Lake Berryessa, Alan told investigators that he had some bloody knives in his car, which is eyebrow raising. Being a hunter, Alan claimed that these knives were bloody because he used them on chickens that he ate, but yeah, this is quite self-incriminating and is extremely suspicious. When Alan was first considered a suspect for the Zodiac Killer, he supposedly liked the attention that came with it, especially since it essentially made people not focus on his molestation accusations, but he quickly started hating it. It's possible that since those knife comments came towards the beginning of his suspicions, he could have been playing it up for the character, which would be an incredibly stupid thing to do, but we have seen people do much crazier things, so I wouldn't say that's impossible. Even if that wasn't the case, it's possible that he was being genuine and actually did use those knives to kill some chickens. But overall, do I think Alan was the Zodiac Killer? Honestly, no. And I have multiple reasons for this. Almost all of it comes down from the whistleblower himself, Don Cheney. You see, his stories over the years are not only contradictory, but as the years went on, they started getting outrageous. In 2006, over 30 years after Don Cheney first started his claims, he was interviewed and claimed that Alan had taken him to a Zodiac crime scene, confessed he was hired as a contracted killer by the husband of one Zodiac victim, had known another victim, and much more nonsense. Cheney's behavior proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was making these stories up. Law enforcement even admitted that Cheney was not a trustworthy source of information. As for why he would do this, it's possible he was trying to get back at Alan for the supposed molestation attempt on his daughter. He also likely enjoyed the publicity as a result of this, and when combined with his increasing age, started making wilder and wilder stories as the years went on, accidentally contradicting himself on multiple occasions in the process. But there is one more important figure to this case, and he is perhaps the most significant reason Alan is as famous of a suspect as he is, and that is Robert Graysmith, the man who wrote the famous Zodiac novel from 1986. In this novel, he ran with the theory that Alan was the killer, and unfortunately, there is a ton of misinformation in it. One big point he made was that Alan's family supposedly stated that they knew Alan was the Zodiac killer. However, this was not true. One other thing Graysmith claimed in his novel was that Alan was identified by multiple people who saw the Zodiac, and this is kind of true. Back in 1969, Mike McGough was interviewed by the police following the Blue Rock Springs shooting. When they asked him what the Zodiac looked like, he claimed that the Zodiac was short, estimated that he was about 5 foot 8, about 195 pounds, and had light brown, almost blonde hair. This did not match the description of Alan at all, who was 6 feet tall, about 250 pounds, and was practically bald. 
1991, after the book Zodiac was published, the police asked Mago again to describe what the Zodiac killer looked like. And this time his description was completely different, as he mentioned a man who was 6 foot 1 and 250 pounds. He was then shown a picture of Alan and was asked to give him a score of certainty out of 10, and he gave it an 8 which sounds quite remarkable. This seems very promising, but it's just too difficult to trust a man who was so inconsistent with his descriptions of what he saw, especially when he was nearly blinded by a flashlight and only caught a glimpse of him for only a second. Not to mention, this was decades later, and Mago had lived a fairly rough life up to that point. Graysmith did use one other survivor from an attack to prove that Zodiac was Alan, and that was Brian Hartnell. Graysmith claimed he identified the Zodiac's voice as being Alan, However, this one was just not true, as Hartnell reportedly told investigators that there was nothing about Alan's physical appearance or voice that would include or exclude him as a suspect. There are also some other notable examples of misinformation regarding Alan's case as a result of the novel, such as Graysmith's claim that Alan had received a speeding ticket near the scene of the attack at Lake Berryessa, which is not true. Graysmith said Zodiac called the residence of famous lawyer Marvin Belly to tell him it was his birthday, which happened to be December 18th. Alan's birthday. This is incredibly false because the caller was proven to be from a patient in a mental asylum, the same patient who famously called Belly on live TV claiming to be the Zodiac. Graysmith also claimed that Alan had a map of the area on him, which was never proven either. Graysmith claimed that he was wearing the same type of boots that Zodiac wore at Lake Berryessa, which again, isn't correct. Graysmith of course claimed that Alan knew and stalked each victim, which once again was never proven. Farron did know a guy named Lee, but it wasn't Arthur Lee Allen. In all reality, the Zodiac probably didn't know any of these victims. These myths are all just scratching the surface, as this novel is absolutely filled to the brim with claims like these. Unfortunately, these claims have become so popular, they are almost universally accepted facts. The David Fincher film also sadly repeats some of these lies, making these lies even more well known. The most extensive example of a myth that is basically considered fact has to belong to the victim Darlene Farron. It is widely believed that she was stalked for many months before she was killed. This was featured in the Zodiac novel, the film, and is overall one of the most famous pieces of information revolving around the case. It all started in the late 1970s when Darlene's babysitter told police about a man sitting in a parked car outside of her home. After this, stories also came from both of Darlene's sisters about this supposed stalker. They got pretty insane too, as the babysitter mentioned that Darlene knew that this stalker killed somebody. When it got to identifying who the stalker may have been, both of the sisters identified Alan. However, they also identified some other people too. Their identification of the other people that weren't Alan is not even close to the biggest flaw with this specific piece of evidence, as this entire stalker story is very suspicious, and there is one reason for that. When this family was interviewed about the murder in 1969, soon after it happened, they never even mentioned this stalker once. And that just does not add up at all. With these insane stories that they mentioned, I simply don't see how it is possible that they did not talk about these stories then. The person they mentioned most was a strange coworker of hers that Darlene talked about. However, they never said anything about him being a stalker or anything, and also referred to him as George and not Alan. This family only started mentioning the supposed stalker in the late 1970s, close to a decade after Darlene's murder, and again, that does simply not add up at all. So I've never really been able to buy into this story fully, and as a result, I'm not going to use this as evidence of identifying Alan. I'll close off Alan's case by mentioning that after the murders, the police were able to retrieve DNA from several Zodiac letters, along with fingerprints on Paul Stein's taxi. This DNA did not match the DNA taken from one of the Zodiac's letters, and several handwriting experts concluded that Alan's handwriting did not match the Zodiac killer's handwriting. All of this shows the unfortunate power that authors can possess in cases like these. We saw it last time with the Black Dahlia, and we're seeing it again here. Because of these fallacies, the vast majority of the public believes that Alan was in fact the Zodiac Killer. When the evidence does not add up, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence pointing to Alan, but upon closer inspection, it all falls apart. With everything we have said about Alan, I think it's safe to say that he has been debunked. So with all of that out of the way, let's move on to the next suspect. Now that the most popular culprit has been taken out of the equation, things are going to get a lot more interesting. For the second suspect on our list, we are going to be going over a man named Ross Sullivan. 
Ross Sullivan has quite a different story than any of the other suspects on the list, as he is mostly associated with a murder in 1966 that could be Zodiac related. Sullivan has really blown up recently due to prominently being featured on the History Channel's documentary series, The Hunt for the Zodiac Killer, which, as we stated, sheds a lot of light onto our suspect here. Ross Sullivan was a library assistant at Riverside and later suffered from schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Sullivan was suspected of being behind a murder at Riverside City College back on October 30th, 1966, more than two years before Zodiac's first confirmed attack. On that date, a woman named Cherry Jo Bates was beaten and stabbed to death in the college parking lot. One of the main reasons this drew the intrigue of many was because her murder featured a knife for a weapon and military boot prints, which were features that some of the Zodiac killings had. But by far, the most notable aspect here is the fact that Riverside Press Enterprise received a letter entitled The Confession where the killer referred to the murder as a game, just like the Zodiac, and it's not the only written evidence. A poem was later found carved into a desk in the library, close to where Bates was murdered. In 1970, handwriting expert Sherwood Morrill claimed the writing on the poem matched the Zodiac letter's style. The confession letter also shares some notable similarities with Zodiac. Both the murderer here and the Zodiac misspelled twitch, and they both used the word squirm as well. In 1967, another letter was sent to the Press Express, claiming more murders will come. At the bottom of the letter, it appears there's a small Z. These are some remarkable similarities. And when I saw this, it really opened my eyes. One other notable similarity is that Ross Sullivan looks like the famous police sketch. And yes, he looks incredibly similar to the sketch. Finally, the Zodiac himself admitted in a letter that he was impressed that the Riverside murder was linked back to him, but promising there are plenty of more murders yet to be found. With all of this evidence put together, it suddenly seems like we have a very formidable culprit out there. But, while on the subjects of sketches, I do want to very quickly mention that you must take the sketches with a grain of salt. Sketches are drawn based on descriptions made by people, and as we have seen earlier, people are simply inconsistent. Not to mention the people who saw Zodiac were, themselves, a victim, and it's hard to remember details after nearly dying. This is why I think it's a good idea to be skeptical of sketches when it's the only available evidence being used to assert someone's guilt. Because these sketches so often aren't going to look anything like the suspect they're based on, even of the two separate sketches of the Zodiac Killer we have, you can already see that they look absolutely nothing alike. So really, in this case, and in any criminal case, if someone looks like a sketch, it's not as strong a piece of evidence as you may think. I mean, the Zodiac sketch is a guy with a military crew cut and glasses in the middle of the Vietnam War. This doesn't narrow it down much. Unless there is also a pile of other legitimate proof to this case, don't rest on just a matching resemblance. Speaking of the case, let's get back to Sullivan in this Riverside case. Of course, we don't know for sure if Sullivan was even the killer of Sherry Jo Bates, especially with her files not being public. However, he was reported not on campus for a few weeks right after the murder. According to some of the staff at RCC, Sullivan also returned with completely different clothes, which for him was very noteworthy as he supposedly wore the same shirt for a very long amount of time right up until he left. With that being said, all of this makes it admittedly pretty plausible that he was behind the murder of Bates. But is there anything that proves that he was behind the Zodiac murders? Well, the way in which he possibly wrote those notes was unbelievably compelling. But several things unfortunately don't add up for Sullivan. For starters, we know that the Zodiac traveled via car, but Sullivan did not have a car. He drove around with a motorcycle. But besides that, it's really the lack of evidence that hurts Sullivan's case. There is nothing tying him to any Zodiac attack, and with the college being about 300 miles away from the other Zodiac crimes, you can't prove with absolute certainty that he was the guy behind the case. Sullivan's age is also a problem. He was in his 20s during the Zodiac's reign, and the lowest estimate of the age for the Zodiac is about 10 years older. It's also entirely possible that the Zodiac was never involved in the murder. Sherwood Morrill's verdict on the writing might look like a slam dunk, but other handwriting experts have expressed doubt that the writing styles match. Zodiac himself saying he did it obviously isn't strong enough evidence, as he would admit to anything that would make him seem even more powerful. It is technically still possible Zodiac was behind the Riverside murder, and that Ross Sullivan was the perpetrator, but I wouldn't be fully willing to put my money on it, not unless some big things come out revolving around him in the near future, which is entirely possible as he has become very popular recently. So, who knows? For now though, there simply isn't enough evidence to prove that he was the Zodiac killer. At least, not yet. So, let's move on to our next suspect. The 
The third suspect on our list here is a man named Richard Gajkowski. Gajkowski came into the public radar in the late 80s, slightly after Graysmith's Zodiac novel was released. As we said, this novel was unbelievably popular, and as a result, it birthed the theorization of many suspects as public interest in the case skyrocketed. One person out of Northern California was named Blaine Blaine, who pointed fingers at a man named Richard Gajkowski. Blaine was the writer for a counterculture newspaper called The Good Times, and one of the writers he worked with was Richard Gajkowski. In the mid-80s, Blaine wrote an 80-page document all about the Zodiac case. He wrote this with the intent of figuring out the ciphers and everything about the case, including who did it. However, the vast majority of his information came from the Zodiac novel, which, as we stated, was not very factual at all. Also, and this has to be said, there is a lot of, well, typos and grammatical mistakes. Despite taking almost all of the information from the Zodiac novel, Blaine Blaine spelled the author's name wrong and even got the date the book was released wrong. Blaine claimed to have visited crime scenes, libraries, and supposedly came across loads of evidence that his former employee was the Zodiac Killer the whole time. After finding this out, he stated that he investigated Gajkowski's family, friends, former employers, and employees, and recorded Gajkowski's telephone conversations without his knowledge or consent. He then wrote a 500-page manuscript all about Gajkowski, in which he then claimed that Gajkowski threatened his life as a result. Out of the entire 500 pages, there somehow isn't even one plausible piece of evidence. We've covered two suspects so far, and while we don't believe they were the Zodiac Killer, at least with those two, there were some suspicious moments where you could be like, okay, well I understand at least why they could be considered a suspect, but with this, I'm just in absolute awe. He seems to frame Gajkowski for a multitude of other murders that happened in California that bared slight similarities to the Zodiac, and just said that Gajkowski did it without even a single piece of evidence to prove it, besides the fact that he lived in the same state, which obviously isn't enough to attribute someone as a killer. He also goes on and on about something called the Golden Calf Killings and talks a lot about a cab driver Gajkowski killed. This driver was not Paul Stein, rather a man named Leonard Carl Smith, who was not considered a Zodiac-related murder. Blaine Blaine also supposedly told police multiple times about Gajkowski, and they understandably didn't take this very seriously. So the next thing Blaine did was mention how there had to be a cover-up going on, which again, featured no real evidence to prove that claim. However, there is one piece of actual evidence that has led supporters of Blaine to genuinely believe that Gajkowski did this, and that all has to do with Nancy Slover. Nancy Slover, if you recall, was the Valaho police dispatcher who answered the Zodiac call after the Blue Rock Springs attack. This means she knew what the Zodiac sounded like, when given a sample of Gajkowski's voice, she said that it was a match. On the surface, this is a humongous lead. However, it is not one that can be taken too seriously, and here's why. Slover said this all during a 2009 documentary entitled Mystery Quest that aired on the History Channel, and well, this was a whole 40 years after she heard the voice. The Zodiac call was not recorded, so she is going entirely by memory. Now a lot of people would argue, well, it was a very memorable voice, and that's a somewhat valid argument. The problem with this hypothesis is that she has claimed several other people sounded like the voice she heard. Slover has said that another suspect, Manson family member, Bruce Davis, sounded a lot like the Zodiac. Slover even said John Carroll Lynch, the actor who played Arthur Lee Allen in David Fincher's Zodiac, talked similar to the killer. These three people don't remotely sound anything alike, and so because of that, we can't trust her word on if Gajkowski actually sounded like the Zodiac or not. This, at first glance, significant evidence is easily debunked. There is much more that has been said about Gajkowski as the owner of TheZodiacKiller.com also lists him as the prime suspect, and in there we have even more falsities mostly coming from Blaine. If we mentioned every single one of these lies, we would probably be here until the new year. Basically though, the main reason I want to mention Gajkowski wasn't even for Gajkowski itself. It was instead to show just how caught up and obsessive people can get in cases like these. After all, that was the central theme in the Zodiac film, and as you can see, it is absolutely true, both in the first suspect we went over and here too. That about wraps this suspect in our Zodiac saga, so let's move on to the next one. For the fourth suspect on our list, we are going to be going over a man named Larry Kane. 
The thing that stands out with Kane among all the other suspects is the eyewitness accounts. Now I know what you might be thinking. We've already talked about the unreliability of eyewitness accounts, so why are we taking it as evidence? Well here's the thing with Larry Kane. Nine people were shown a picture of Larry Kane and identified him as the Zodiac Killer. And that's, well, a lot of people. It's one thing for someone to say that you were the Zodiac Killer once, but when it's nine? That's something. This is the reason Kane has become a popular suspect over the years, and that is a big deal. However, here's the thing. These nine identifications are kind of taken out of context, so let's look a little deeper into them. One of the supposed witnesses, a police officer named Harvey Hines, actually identified Kane as a possible suspect in the murder of a woman named Dana Lull in Nevada. This identification does not count because it revolves around an entirely different case that is not connected to Zodiac. Another one of the witnesses talked about it online and mentioned seeing Kane at Lake Berryessa on the day of the attack, where he also claimed they saw the Zodiac victim swimming that day. This is a lie, as Brian Hartnell has stated that neither he nor Cecilia Shepard went swimming that day. This witness cannot be proven anyway, it's just someone on the internet claiming things, and we all know you can't take that at face value, so neither will we. Kathleen Johns was someone who claimed to have been abducted by a man who resembled the Zodiac sketches, and the Zodiac himself claimed credit for the attempted abduction. In 1992, she identified Kane as her abductor. For this one, we actually can't directly disprove or prove anything here at all. We have no way of knowing if she actually was almost kidnapped by Kane or not. Unlike the other identifications, outside of some minor details being changed over time, there isn't much to contradict this claim. So basically, we can't prove or debunk anything here at all. Brian Hartnell himself was interviewed in 1994, and he stated that Kane's voice and speech pattern was somewhat similar to the Zodiac Killer's, and also claimed that he would never forget that voice. However, a few years later, he said that maybe he could forget that voice. He also never outwardly said that this is indeed the same voice, so it's not strong enough evidence. The next witness was Dan Fook, the cop that at the time unknowingly drove right past the Zodiac Killer, right after Paul Stein's murder. Fook stated that the jowls matched up and the face was rounded like that, but since it was 20 years later, he couldn't know for sure if this was really him. He did however state that out of the hundreds of pictures he had seen over the years, this was the one that stood out the most. Still though, Fook only gave it a maybe, which again isn't a ringing endorsement. One more thing to add, he drove past him, which means that in reality he probably saw him for maybe 10 seconds, which is a ridiculously small amount of time to catch a solid glimpse of someone's face. Overall, I don't think this proves anything. The next witnesses belong to the aforementioned family of Darlene Farron, who, as we mentioned way back, have a very suspect stalker theory going on. But as we said, the story there was continually changing, so we are also not going to consider their identifications of Kane to be valid either. So, as you can see, nearly all of these identifiers were sketchy at best, meaning the seemingly impressive amount of witnesses' evidence working in Kane's favor doesn't hold a lot. Kathleen John's identification remains the only notable piece of evidence, but one piece of identification isn't enough to seal the deal. As one last thing to note, Harvey Hines, the police officer we mentioned before, began a minor investigation into Kane, and he took his fingerprints with suspected Zodiac fingerprints, and it was not a match. So yeah, despite seemingly entirely plausible at first glance, Larry Kane is not our Zodiac killer either. Well, at this point, we are almost finished with all of our suspects. For our second to last suspect, we are going to go over a man named Richard Marshall. For Marshall, he has a multitude of interesting aspects that make him seem plausible, so let's take a look at all of them. For one, Marshall was super into old films, and one of his favorites was The Red Phantom, which was mentioned in one of the Zodiac's possible final letters. Another film he was definitely aware of was the 1932 film adaptation of The Most Dangerous Game, which is possibly alluded to in the Zodiac's only cracked cipher. Marshall also reportedly lived in a basement apartment in San Francisco on Scott Street, which is pretty close to the final confirmed Zodiac kill. To add on to that, the Zodiac mentioned having a basement in multiple letters, which is important as at the time, there was not a large enough number of basements in the San Francisco area. He also previously lived in Riverside in 1966, possibly connecting him to Sherry Jo Bates. However, of course, Marshall still falls short in a few ways. For one, he also failed the fingerprint test, and two, and perhaps more importantly, there isn't a single piece of proof that points to him being a violent person at all. 
He was quite the odd fellow, but odd doesn't mean murderous. Plus, when you think about it more, a person that happened to be into classic films and also lived in San Francisco isn't shocking. A lot of film buffs and directors lived in the area, like any area really. Overall, as you can see, there were some interesting parallels, but until more definitive proof comes out that he had violent tendencies, I just don't see it. The late Napa County Sheriff Detective Ken Narlow said it best, Marshall makes really good reading, but is not a very good suspect in my estimation. And at long last, we've made it to the final suspect of our video here, and we're going to be discussing the case of Earl Van Best. And this one here is going to sound a little familiar. The reason I say this is because it's a case of someone pinpointing their own father as the Zodiac. Many people have claimed their father was the Zodiac Killer since the 1960s. Notable examples include Dennis Kaufman accusing his father Jack Terrence in 2007, and an old friend of ours, Steve Hodell, who as we all know, was convinced that his father George Hodell murdered Elizabeth Short. Well, in 2009, he claimed his father was the Zodiac along with dozens of other killers. None of these people are as famous as Gary Stewart, though. Stewart claimed that his biological father, Earl Van Best, was the Zodiac Killer. His novel, The Most Dangerous Man of All, described the search for his biological father and his eventual realization that he was likely the Zodiac Killer all along. The theory has gotten a lot of traction, even resulting in a TV miniseries this year. But was Van Best really Zodiac? Let's take a look at the evidence. A lot of Stewart's evidence comes from his belief that the ciphers say his father's name. However, his evidence for these often relies on assumptions rather than actual proof. For example, he claimed that because an unsolved cipher contained 13 symbols and his father named had 13 letters, this could not be a coincidence. Really, I shouldn't even need to explain why this is a stretch. There are loads of other deciphering moments that supposedly spell out his dad's name, but for every one of them, he never offers a legitimate reason to believe him other than the fact that he said so. In the description of this video, I'll put down a link of all the rest of their methods of code solving being debunked, so if you want more reasons not to believe this part of the evidence, you can click that link. But with that being said, let's go on to other pieces of evidence. Another large piece of evidence belonged to some of the fingerprint readings. At the very last Zodiac crime, there were fingerprints found at the one scene, and at one point, Stewart went to have these fingerprints compared. While the police could not make a positive match between the possible Zodiac fingerprints and the fingerprints of Van Best, he did provide a visual comparison of both fingers. However, both of them featured what seemed to be a scar. However, for whatever reason, Stewart assumed that the suspect fingerprint in question was reversed, perhaps only to suit their needs reversing it made it match better. Not only that, but it's possible this faint line on the finger was only there as a result of the indentation on the surface of the cab. Some people like to claim the fingerprints in questions weren't from the Zodiac, but there's no documented or witness-based evidence saying otherwise. It's just something people like to say when DNA evidence doesn't match their favorite suspect. And make no mistake, Van Best's fingerprints did not match. He also mentioned that Van Best was charged for statutory rape and uses that to prove that he was capable of such disgusting, immoral actions. While it definitely demonstrates that he was capable of some despicable, horrible acts, it doesn't prove that he was a murderer. There's also more typical pieces of evidence that you can find for a lot of the other Zodiac suspects out there, such as Van Best slightly resembling the famous sketch, and Van Best being in California at the time, both of which are close to meaningless for obvious reasons. And of course, this would not be complete without claims of a police cover-up. Because the police wouldn't allow him to see Van Best's police file, he automatically claimed a cover-up was happening, perhaps an excuse to help him explain his lack of actual evidence to attribute the crimes to his father. Oh, and Google isn't helping at all either, as when you Google the Zodiac Killer, Van Best photo is the first one that shows up. And that's about all for Earl Van Best over here, and by extension, this concludes all the suspects that we have laid out in this video. As you can see, misinformation involving the various suspects is everywhere. Nearly everyone has a significant misconception or flat out lie somewhere, but as a great man once wrote, when the truth gets buried deep beneath a thousand years of sleep, time demands a turnaround, and once again, the truth is found. Now, who was the Zodiac Killer? 
Well, this is our best guess judging by the evidence available. Appearance-wise, he was probably in his mid-30s or maybe older. However, this is the aspect we will likely forever know the least about, due to the vastly changing eyewitness accounts. He likely had military experience at decryption. Psychologically, his boasts about slaves were probably lies, as we all know he was about attention. Nearly everything he did was done to intimidate and scare others, as being the boogeyman was his greatest desire. He also wanted to show off how smart he was with the letters and ciphers. The unsolved ciphers may have no real answer, and if they do, he didn't give away his identity. His actions indicate a mix of narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. Each crime was different in weapon usage and tactics used, both as a way to confuse law enforcement and to correct errors done in the previous attack. He knew none of the victims. It was purely random. He took credit for crimes he didn't do, possibly including Sherry Jo Bates and Kathleen Johns, among others. Perhaps by 1974, he felt he had completed all his goals and stopped, similar to Ed Kemper. Does this describe any suspect? Sadly, it doesn't, indicating that most likely, similar to the Golden State Killer, the real murderer is somebody no armchair detective has considered. Overall, this video took on quite a different end result than I expected. Usually with a murder case, there is at least one substantial lead that makes sense, and when coming into this video, I obviously expected that to be the case. But, as you can clearly see, that did not happen. This is one of the few times where I genuinely believe that none of the existing known suspects are the Zodiac Killer at all. While most of them have at least one suspicious aspect, none of them have remotely come close to enough evidence to prove they are the Zodiac Killer. This has become a highly controversial case over the years, with so many people losing so much due to obsession. Still, at the end of the day, I don't believe the Zodiac hides within anybody that we know. He haunts California like a ghost. Always heard, but never seen. Perhaps recent DNA techniques will one day reveal who the Zodiac was, but nothing is certain. Down through all eternity, the crying of humanity was his wish, and he no doubt got everything he wanted and more. Maybe somewhere in the country, an old man sits, still waiting to be found, half a century later. This is a video we debated making for a very long time, as we didn't know if we would truly be able to add anything after so many videos and pieces of media had been made about the case. But I realized that within each suspect came a cesspool of misinformation and out of context evidence, so hopefully all of you watching could learn something here today. Hopefully one day we will finally figure out, once and for all, who was the man behind the most infamous unsolved killing spree in American history. Thank you guys so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed the second video of Debunktober. Get ready for the final one. Make sure to follow all of our social medias for updates and exclusive content, all linked in the description. Especially consider becoming a patron, as even $1 a month really helps and you guys get some really slick rewards. And of course, make sure to like this video, share this with your friends, and subscribe. As always, my name is Seth from Debunk File. Thank you guys so much for watching. Bye.